in this lecture we'll be <clears throat> looking at a central quantity uh, that differentiates thermodynamics from mechanics in terms of energy what is called internal energy and uh, uh, it's strongly correlated to temperature of the system and how do we increase the temperature of the system okay so it's a very important concept so let's get on with it. So in the previous lecture uh, <clears throat> on ideal gas and work, uh, what we tried to do was we connected pressure, a pressure that was computed from microscopic arguments. Okay, we started with uh, gases that are moving in a particular way, the momentum change as it interacts with the wall, and we connected that to the pressure, internal pressure, uh, and the external pressure. And then what we did was there was an empirical relationship connecting the measured pressure with the measured temperature. Okay, so we substituted the derived pressure into this expression and we derived an important relationship. It's a beautiful relationship called the equipartition theorem. So what does that tell you? It connects the kinetic energy of the motion of the atom. Okay, so this is an ideal gas atom, okay, ideal gas containing many ideal gas atoms. So it connects the kinetic energy of uh, ideal gas atom to the temperature, measured temperature of the system, all right? So uh, the ideal gas atom is has three degrees of freedom, three translation degrees of freedom. That is three ways in which it can store in energy. So this is the total velocity, okay, total uh, speed. It's not just speed along x, y, or z direction. It is the overall speed. So this is the total kinetic energy. So that is equal to, we said that it is three, that is the degrees of freedom, and each degree of freedom, that is half kT that is told, okay? So this is a very, very important thing, uh, important relationship, because it helps us connect an macroscopic variable, the important macroscopic variable, which is the measured temperature, to a microscopic quantity, okay? This is like a mechanical quantity. This is a thermodynamical quantity. So this connection is made by equipartition theorem, okay? So that is the a first step we have taken in translating our concepts in mechanics to thermodynamics, okay? So this is very important. So again, to stress that this is not center of mass velocity, okay? So this uh, ideal gas, which we are thinking, that is not moving at a particular manner. This is not a center of mass velocity. This is the average velocity. It's not just a velocity because we said that at a given instant, if you look at one particular atom, uh, it uh, there's a stochastic uh, collisions with the wall. Okay, So the way we did averaging was <clears throat> actual average was done over time and over all the molecules that were present. Right. So with that, we were able to get a steady pressure. This computed pressure was a steady pressure because of all the averaging that went into it. We didn't do it in great detail, but it can be potentially done and relaxing all the approximations we use for the, getting that simple expression. So what did we accomplish with that? Okay, We accomplished an important thing. That is the meaning of the measured macroscopic temperature uh, in terms of a microscopic mechanical variable. Okay, That is the... Uh, um, average velocity, average speed of the ideal gas atom. So let's move on. We want to take the next step here. So in class, uh, the macroscopic thermodynamics, classical thermodynamics, we are always will be looking at a continuum. Okay, this continuum is not uh, just a macroscopic thermodynamic issue. It's also there in classical mechanics, in fluid mechanics, and solid mechanics. We have. A continuum. So, what do you exactly mean by mean by that? It's a continuous sequence in which adjacent segments are not perceptibly different from each other. Okay. So, this is a, a slight modification of a, a dictionary definition. Uh, so, it is continuous. Okay. There is no uh, <coughs> smaller segments. Okay. There are no finer segments. It's all. Uh, that's what we mean by continuum. Okay, there's no holes uh, at of any length scale. Okay, so of in with adjacent uh, segment uh, means there is some variable that can change. Okay, uh, pressure can change, temperature distribution can. Right? That's what how you define 
uh, segments, but these are all continuous things that are not perceptibly different from each other. Okay, so there is a continuity in the change also. Okay, so in terms of we cannot we are not resolving matter into electrons or at, uh, atoms. Okay, so this has uh, that was the way because before uh, microscopes were uh, discovered. Okay, so you couldn't you couldn't resolve it. Okay, so everything looked like a continuum. Okay, if you look at a, a solid, uh, so you know that there are solid atoms that are arranged in in discrete manner. Okay, but the atom look like a continuous thing because there's a lot of fundamental reason why it behaves like uh, a continuum. We won't go into that, but that's the way one way of looking at things. Okay, so. For a continuum, we, when we think about, let's say, an uh, uh, object, okay, a fluid object or a solid object, we can always think about uh, kinetic energy, which is a directional kinetic energy. Okay, the motion is along a particular direction. Uh, so motion of the center of mass. We can also have uh, the center of mass lifted in a particular way or displaced in a particular way within a force field. So we can also define a potential energy for uh, this object, right? So again, where are we the, in this journey? The co where in this course right now we want to move from mechanics to thermodynamics, right? So there are some important extensions we are doing to mechanics so that we can accommodate thermodynamics. So the question we want to answer are something like this: Is the energy content of Bumbra's fastball okay, one fifty kilometers per hour? Is it the same if he is bowling in an Australian winter or a Kanpur summer? Okay, is it the, is the energy content okay different? Uh, is it is it something beyond just the kinetic energy, or is the energy content of a copper metal block okay elevated to thousand meters? Okay, so at one kilometer, it's, uh, you've done some work against the gravitational field. The potential energy has increased, but the temperature is different. Okay, so there are two copper blocks. Let's say one is at 50 degrees centigrade, another at 500 degrees centigrade. Is the overall energy content different? Okay, so, so what is the question we're asking? Even though potential energy and kinetic energy are can be the same, because of difference in temperature, is the energy content different? Okay, that's the question we're answering. So in classical mechanics, you know what is called an important theorem or the what is called the work energy theorem, okay, in classical mechanics. So the net work done on a particle equals the change in particle's kinetic energy, okay. So how did we think about this? Uh, so the, the work is done and then the, we are considering uh, the kinetic uh, energy at position B and position A. So when you do work on an object, uh, there are forces that are uh, the object feels because of it, there's a velocity gain. Uh, eventually, the kinetic energy increases. Okay, so it's a very fundamental theorem of uh, classical mechanics that uh, you must have solved many problems with uh, work energy, loop the loop, and many other things. Okay, so there are lots of interesting things that can be done with work energy theorem. So, again, in our uh, how do we extend uh, our uh, move in our journey, move from Classic, what we know from classical mechanics to thermodynamics. These are all elementary notions which you've seen uh, from high school mechanics. Okay, how do we move on to thermodynamics? All right, so an important jump was made empirically by Jules's experiment. This is one of the beautiful set of experiments that gave us insight into things that couldn't be seen. Okay, that's the beauty of experiments. And how they thought about, so look at the time. Okay, so this was the time when uh, nothing could be seen. Okay, but they imagined all these things in a beautiful manner and it was interpreted uh, later. Okay, so we'll look at the experiments. So there's a very nice demonstration in Mathematica website. I would uh, take you to that website. Uh, this is the demonstration. So what was the experiment? So, so this is the a container which has an adiabatic wall, okay? So what do you mean by an adiabatic wall? There is, cannot be any heat transfer between uh, the system and the environment. Heat cannot come in, heat cannot go, in, uh, go out, all right? So that's what you mean by an adiabatic wall and it's also a rigid wall, okay? So there is no real 
uh, PV work that is being done. The only way you can put in or remove he uh, work is via this paddle wheel moving around. Okay, so if you first you can uh, right, so you can uh, first manually probably lift the uh, <coughs> this block, and then when this block is allowed to fall. Uh, what happens? The paddle moves, right? So it can. This can be a free fall, or in, in or it can be uh, made to move in a very gradual manner, in in a, what we call quasi-static manner, for example. So you can do this, all right? So you can do this continuously also, so that uh, you can do it at uh, so uh, in a particular uh, in this particular manner. So what is the objective here? We have an understanding of work done. Okay, so a lowering and raising of mass, uh, we know we can, how to think about raising and lowering of mass in terms of work done, all right? So this work is done, for example, on this system, which is contained within an adiabatic rigid uh, rod, okay? A rigid container, all right? So uh, what happens? Okay, that's the question we are trying to ask. Okay, supposing I uh, do this work, and then it's a good container. It's the the heat that is not lost. Let's say, and then I brought things to rest. That is, I'm no longer shaking the table. Okay, uh, shaking the paddle. So when I have done that, so it is at a particular position. So there is uh, the system is at a particular position. The potential energy is not increasing. Okay. So after all this motion of the paddle, I've stopped the paddle. So the kinetic energy is also not, uh, it's not sloshing away. In any case, the, the container is at that position. Okay. The center of mass motion is zero, always zero. Right? It can be slow sloshing inside, but overall, uh, there is no change in uh, the center of mass position and center of mass velocities. Okay. So the potential energy and kinetic energy have not changed. So the question is, what has gone, what happened to the work done on the system, okay? That is contained within an adiabatical wall, okay, rigid wall, and the center of mass, uh, kinetic energy, potential energy has not changed, right? So this is an important statement, okay? The, uh, important observation. The temperature increased, okay? So, how are we? Why did we do the last lecture? Okay, we in the last lecture we connected, made this connection between the microscopic velocities and temperature. Okay, if the temperature increases, what can we say? We know that the average velocity of the liquid of the atoms of, that make up the liquid inside uh, this adiabatically uh, contained wall. Okay, that increases. That is the liquids. So, see, uh, adiabatic wall uh, contains the liquid. Okay, so if the temperature of this liquid increases, uh, uh, what what can we say? We can say that the average kinetic energy, okay, uh, increases. Uh, average translation kinetic energy that is stored uh, inside this uh, with this using these atoms has increased. All right. So uh, no, this is not the center of mass velocities, okay? So we are not talking about center of mass velocities. We are only talking about atomic velocities, which are moving in random manner, okay? So that is what equipartition theorem correlates to the measured temperature, okay? Those temperature measurement, how was it made? By some kind of a thermometer, okay? They knew, uh, as I said, thermometer gave rise to the birth of thermometer. Okay, it's important. Without thermometer, without barometer, we, we couldn't have really done any thermodynamics. Okay, so that gave rise, measuring instruments give rise to new fields. Okay, most of the Nobel prizes in physics, if you see, was because of some measurement that was made possible. Okay, which gave rise to new physics. All right, so uh, so this is very important to understand what and and uh, at that time, okay, the equipartition theorem was not uh, used, but now we know equipartition theorem. It gives us a better insight, so we can interpret the temperature increase to increase in the average velocity of the atoms of the liquid. This should be adiabatically contained wall, okay, not adiabatically walled container. Container, okay, so that's also okay. Okay, so what is this microscopic degree of freedom? 
it provides an additional way of storing energy okay we know two ways of storing energy from your classical mechanics one is kinetic energy uh, that involve directional motion okay of the center of mass a directional positional change that is what i mean is there's a force field against the force field you are moving uh, the object so that gives rise to increase in potential energy but beyond that there are these additional degrees of freedom which is what makes up the internal energy okay but this velocity is random okay as opposed to this directional motion this is random okay so it is moving in an all possible direction okay there is no reason in fact if it is moving in one particular direction that will result in movement of the center of mass okay uh, that's not what is happening it is moving isotropically it is moving in all possible direction with all possible velocities the velocities there is a particular distribution of velocities which is indicative of the temperature okay so what did we understand in the previous lecture if the temperature increases the average velocity increases there will be some molecules that are less than the average velocity there are some molecules that are more than the average velocity this is what you mean by maximal boltzmann distribution there is a gaussian distribution in velocities but temperature can be correlated to average velocity okay so that's what we it is important to note and that is a random motion that's what we are talking about here so i'll just read out because i phrased it in a particular way so because this, this is a summary so in jules experiment the work done on the system because of the raising and lowering okay so or we can move the paddle given with the hand okay uh, but with the raising and lowering of the weight we know quantitatively how much is the work done on the system or by the system okay so we are trying to do work on the system within an adiabatically walled container what does it do this work in some ways uh, is gets converted to heat okay this is what you mean by viscous dissipation okay uh, this liquid has viscosity there is dissipation uh, inside the liquid that increases the capacity of the system okay to store heat all right see you will learn in the next lecture or so work and heat are internal energy in transit okay these are energy in transit this is the way the system interacts with the environment work and heat okay are the way system interacts with uh, environment and the work and heat okay is stored as thermal energy what do we mean by that the when we say thermal energy increases we mean the temperature increases by that this average velocity random velocity increases random speed increases okay so this is the crux okay of understanding internal energy so uh, and the connect this with equipartition okay we could have done the entire thing even without equipartition but i feel this is much more logical okay introducing equipartition and then jules experiment okay so because you really don't know what is temperature without equipartition okay so temperature is a thermodynamic variable that's all right but beyond that i also you know okay we are not in 1800s okay we are in 2020 all right we know that there are atoms we can see atoms we can see electrons uh and so on okay uh so how do i think about the temperature measurements in terms of microscopy is also important see what is more interesting is the following okay so jule found that you can do many forms of work on the system not just this paddle motion okay you can do uh there are a few other things he did electrical uh work on the system if you do equivalent amount of work okay not just this paddle using paddle shaft work but also by electrical work the raise in temperature was very similar within the experimental accuracy at that time that was available he observed a similar increase in temperature this is a remarkable result okay at that time okay so because this showed something nice okay that all work can be converted to heat okay uh, re and resulted in an increase in temperature okay so it's a very very important result uh, you have to think deeply into uh, this particular experiment uh, one of the most important experiments in thermodynamics so let us uh, as i said this your book has very nice pictures uh, so what are we talking about 
So we are talking about two kind of two forms of kinetic energy. Okay? So there is a macroscopic kinetic energy. Uh, okay, so that when everything are moving in a particular direction. Okay, so that's uh, this is a artistic rendition. Okay, so don't uh, don't keep asking whether everything is very accurately done. Okay, so there are some inaccuracies, uh, but it conveys something. Okay, this directional motion. Okay, of the fluid. It will help you move this paddle. For example, it can be a turbine in a particular way. Okay, that's possible. Okay, this is the way hydro electric dram, dams work. Okay, this can be a motor which will generate electricity. Okay. So, but what we are talking about is there is another kinetic energy which is random. Okay, this is the microscopic kinetic kinetic energy of the molecules. This does not uh, turn the wheel, right? So here. Uh, what is this purpose of this illustration? There is a paddle here, okay? Because this movement is random. This the the paddle is not moving in a particular direction. There can be fluctuation of the paddle. Okay, momentarily it can move on one side. In next moment it has to move in the opposite side. On an average, this paddle is not moving at all. Okay, so there can be fluctuations. Uh, momentary movement of the pad, momentary rotation of the paddle, but on an average, the paddle is static. But because water is flowing out, when I say flowing out, there is a directional movement of the water. This direction of the mo movement of water rotates this turbine, turbine, okay, which generates electricity. Okay, so what the the import of this is you should be able to differentiate between microscopic random motion and macroscopic directional kinetic energy. Okay. And the microscopic degrees of freedom can be uh, many, okay, many forms. Uh, the easiest degree of freedom that can be excited, okay, at any non-zero temperature, okay. So anyway, you cannot reach zero Kelvin, okay. At any non-zero Kelvin, there is always some uh, vibrations or translations, okay. For if you have take an ideal gas, this is the ease, more, easiest excitable degree of motion. This is a, it's very easy to make things move, okay. There are a lot of reasons why velocity. Uh, based on fundamental quantum mechanics also, right? If the velocity is made zero, if I know velocity to be zero, I have an absolute uncertainty in the position. So therefore, I don't know where that particle is going to be inside the box, okay? So this is the easiest thing that can be made to, uh, the microscopic degree of freedom that can be excited. For an ideal gas, uh, there are three and so on, okay? We have you've done some problems in your tutorial. There can be rotation, which is the next uh, thing that can be easily excited. There can be vibrations. If you have H2, H2 has two rotation degree of freedom. It has a vibration, it has vibration degrees of freedom. Mostly what we are talking about when we say internal energy, we are talking about excitable degrees of freedom. Okay, so if you are at, uh, we know, for example, if you have a hydrogen atom, I know 13.6 or 13.2 electron volts is the ionization energy, right? So, see, have one number in your mind, okay? Kt at room temperature, okay? So, um, is only 26 milli electron volt, okay? Every scientist, every engineering student should have this number. What is Kt in terms of electron volts, okay? So, um, uh, the Kt in room temperature is only 26 milli electron volts, okay? So, 0 0.026 electron volts. But the bond energies are about one or two EV, Okay, electron volts. The kind, the ionization energy of electron is thirteen point around thirteen electron volts. Okay, so at normal temperatures, okay, so you cannot do ionization of uh, uh, the electronic ionization are not excited. Okay, in most of the engineering applications, we can say the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. This is a picture that we got from your book textbook, Schengel and Bolus. But in most of the engineering application, unless you're doing nuclear engineering or something like plasma engineering, uh, this electrons excitation and nuclear excitation don't happen. Okay, we call those excitation as being cold. Okay, those modes are being cold. Okay, what is hot? What are what what degrees of freedom that have been excited are translation, rotation, and vibration. Okay, so that's what we uh, I want to convey with this thing. So energy, which is thermodynamics, is the science of energy, uh, is very important for energy capture, conversion, and storage. 
So if uh, supposing you get from a nuclear power plant, okay, so in India, nuclear contribution is about five, okay, so it's not a lot, but in France, it's around six, 60 percent and so on. There are countries which have uh, major nuclear power plants, okay, so if you get from your electricity from a uh, nuclear power plant, there are many, many forms of energy it encounters. There is nuclear uh, uh, fission that is happening, then there is thermal, mechanical, kinetic, magnetic, electrical. We'll go into this a little bit uh, in the next few lectures, but uh, there, are, there are multiple scales in energy. Okay? So we should be at least aware, even though we, uh, if you're, let's say, if you're going to be working with pumps, okay, so you would be interested in only one kind, okay, or if you're a chemical engineer, or if you're an aerospace engineer, okay, only one kind of thing you'd be focusing, but at least for the scope of this course, you should be at least aware that uh, of the multi-scale nature of energy. So what is the central crux? Okay, The central theme was to introduce internal energy. Okay, So there are some beyond the center of mass position correlated with potential energy, beyond the center of mass motion correlated with macroscopic kinetic there are internal degrees of freedom that gives you additional way of storing energy, okay? And that are correlated to increase in temperature and then movement of, uh, random movement of atoms, okay? Atoms, it can be translation, rotation, vibration, and so on, phonons, okay? And so on. So what we would try to do is we would try to fully establish the thermodynamic equivalent of classical mechanics work energy theorem. Okay, the work energy theorem you knew from classical mechanics. We introduce one component that is the internal energy. We would also clarify and elaborate these two things. What are these two things? This is the work, uh, this is the heat uh, exchange between the system and uh, surrounding. Okay, and this is the work exchange between the system and surrounding. Okay, so you cannot talk about the heat of a system and the work of a system, okay? These are all when uh, exchanges, okay? These are all energy in transit, okay? Uh, heat and work is energy in transit, okay? So uh, what exists for a system, we can talk about internal energy of a system or the thermal energy of a system, which is correlated to temperature, all right? With that, I will stop. Thank you.